Um, so thanks everyone for, for joining. I can't see you and don't know who you are. That's probably all the better for me. Um, and I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Kate, Steph and uh, Maeve, my colleagues in uh, organizing this uh, series of seminars, which unfortunately I've chosen to place myself as well um, for the great work and putting this together and, and really helping me out today as well as I, as I focused on, on preparing the, the talk itself. So I hadn't realized when I agreed to schedule my own talk on this, this day that it was the US election day and uh, I'm feeling rather numb and lacking in sleep as many of you might be as well, which doesn't uh, help adjust to the first uh, uh, Zoom talk. So this is kind of a bit of a sketchy stab, first stab at uh, what I'm gonna talk about. Um, and maybe just a chance to, to air a little bit around this and get some feedback. But uh, I'm gonna have to do something that I really hate to do, which is kind of partially read especially when I'm making eye contact with unknown people on the screen. So excuse me if it's a little rusty. Um, and before I start, I, I put in the, the chat, which you can look at, a link to uh, a NASA video of their recent uh, Osiris Rex uh, mission or ongoing mission, which was to, to map and take samples from the asteroid Bennu, which is a, a mere 337 million uh, kilometers from Earth. Um, and it's been circling the, the asteroid for about two years. And then in October in last month, towards the end of the month, uh, a probe landed and took uh, some samples of dust and rock to be returned to, to Earth in, in 2023 for analysis at NASA's labs. Uh, and there's an eight second video there. It's kind of like, like a GIF that, that NASA generated of that action of the kind of a probe going down and, and uh, kind of breaking into the, the surface of the asteroid. Um, it had some problems in the sense that the, the probe, which was grabbing the, the, the dust and rock samples, um, got some bigger rocks than uh, it imagined because uh, it struck with a bit more force and some rocks got jammed into the um, the probe arm and some of the sample has been lost on the, the kind of ascent back from the asteroid into orbit. So some of the, the technical issues that, that, that might face um, future space mining. Um, it's quite interesting to see this and, and I put it not really for the kind of gee whiz kind of effect but rather because it helps us kind of see maybe and, and look very directly at the relationship emerging between the study of off-Earth or alien geologies and the extension of US state power, and the role that both of these play in the production of speculative markets for so-called space resources, the materials or minerals uh, or otherwise, uh, a lot of it is about kind of precious metals, but also water um, that can be extracted from off-Earth bodies for commercial purposes. Um, and it, I should also hasten to add that the, the US uh, NASA is not the first space program to have done such a, a feat. Uh, JAXA, the Japanese space agency, has had uh, two um, almost completed missions, uh, Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2, to uh, an asteroid, similar asteroid, to taking um, samples. And, and in fact, they already returned with asteroid samples in 2010 from that first mission and the second ex expected soon. So what my talk will focus on today is how we might understand the United States Geological Survey's recent entrance into the field of space resource prospecting in light of those dynamics that I mentioned about the kind of relationship between geological sciences and the extension of US power in outer space and the relationship between the extension of US power and geological science in the production of uh, speculative markets for space resources. I, I think just before I kind of go on, it's, it's worth kind of dwelling a little bit for a second on what it means to kind of look at outer space as a kind of critical social scientist or, or human geography. Um, and, and this, what I'm going to talk about today, kind of fits into a wider project of, of mine, looking at the changing nature of the kind of human presence in outer space and the kind of geopolitical, environmental and cultural kind of uh, stakes and dimensions of this. So many commentators, um, oh, my slides are frozen. Oh, there we go. Many commentators have argued that we're living in a, in a so-called second space age where the human presence in outer space is undergoing rapid expansion and profound change. And the critical social scientists, uh, amongst, I among, number myself amongst, have kind of asked a series of questions about these changes. Who is it that's active in outer space? How is that changing? What are these actors doing or what are they hoping to do in outer space? How are those activities being governed or not governed, as it might be? And what consequences might these activities have for, uh, for whom and, and where? And these are questions which human geographers are eminently well placed to explore, yet outer space remains a, a kind of an area largely overlooked in the discipline. You might say kind of out of field sight, out of mind perhaps. Um, 
However, this is, this is definitely rapidly changing. Uh, there's quite a number of, of human geographers, particularly, are starting to look at uh, human presence in outer space uh, alongside colleagues in anthropology, archaeology, and sociology. Um, and looking at the kind of nature and stakes of how we, what, what humans are doing in outer space, what activities are happening, how those uh, activities and outer space is imagined, or the imaginaries of outer space, and the plans and projections uh, for, the, for human futures in outer space. And so it's important to note that when studying these human designs in outer space, we're fundamentally un involved in trying to understand how outer space is constructed as a, a kind of contested object of concern on Earth, and how this both reflects earthly arrangements of power and terrestrial social relations and feeds back upon them in turn. So we're kind of looking at a kind of dialectical understanding of the relationship between the terrestrial and the extraterrestrial domains, between uh, what goes on on Earth and what goes on off Earth. In a sense, the aim of kind of maybe some of the critical social scientists and certainly my own work is to in some sense bring outer space back down to earth, locating them within a more familiar and perhaps even mundane social context within which they take shape and have effects. Yet at the same time, and, and this is why I prompt you to look at the, the Osiris Rex um, little video in, in, the, in the chat, is that we do so in a way that doesn't ignore the advances in scientific knowledge and technical capacities that are shaping the horizon of possibility for what uh, the future of the human presence in, in outer space may be. So one of the key aspects uh, of this kind of changing uh, human presence in outer space, is, or the so-called second space age that I want to dwell on, is the growing role being carved out for the private sector and commercial enterprise in outer space, or rather the production of outer space, if we will, as an arena for capitalist accumulation. Over the last three decades, there has been a, a focus campaign involving both commercial and state bodies to shift uh, dominant perceptions of outer space and the human presence within it away from scientific exploration and towards commercial exploitation. And this move from exploration to exploitation has been shaped by those interested in seeing private enterprise and corporate profits become the main beneficiary or a central beneficiary of an expanding human presence in outer space. And again, I'll be talking about the United States uh, today, but it's not a peculiarly American phenomena, uh, but the outsized scale of the sector and the United States and the kind of ideological predilection for locating markets at the heart of governance that has typified the period of neoliberal hegemony in, in the US and its leadership of let's say global order has meant that the tendency is particularly marked in the United States. Uh, I'm aware of course, that there, there's definitely a kind of a, a geopolitics of knowledge, if, if you will, of where we focus our attention of research. And most of the rest of my research uh, in this area is focused on uh, European states rather than the United States. I really lack the, the language skills to engage with some of the very interesting things going on in, in Russia, China, uh, Brazil, United Arab Emirates. Um, uh, so I excuse myself for my, uh, Western-centric focus of the talk today. Um, and one key group uh, that I want to look at here is the, oh, my slide is in the wrong order, is the Space Frontier Foundation. They're a US-based lobby group with roots in the libertarian right, uh, founded in the 19, 1980s, that's focused on the development of the private sector in outer space. Uh, and it kind of frames the, the final frontier as a supposed free market frontier. And in such narratives, outer space not only represents a potentially profitable arena for capitalist accumulation, corporate profits, uh, and commercial development, but marks a, a necessary step in the long-term survival of the human species. While some such thinking might seem kind of far out, so to speak, the Space Frontier Foundation and a host of related individuals and groups promoting the same kind of millenarian market-based solutions to planetary extinction on Earth have been remarkably successful in shaping the discursive context in which space policy has been developed in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. Um, the space, and I, and I show here, this is just some of the kind of media discussions of, of our recent years from the business press, from the mainstream press, with this kind of a bonanza of space resources that lies beyond. Um, again, picked up, this was a frontier conference run by uh, President Obama just in the last months of his presidency some years ago. Um, kind of using kind of space as a, an arena within which to imagine and develop uh, U.S. Uh, technology businesses. Um, and New Space, uh, the Space Frontier Foundation invented the term New Space to describe the new generation of private space companies, a term that's been widely adopted to describe this growing sector by not only media, but also governments and NGO organizations. And indeed, 
the, the group, the Space Frontier Foundation, now host regular international uh, new space conferences in collaboration with national governments across Europe who have kind of bought into this uh, new space brand and are keen to kind of promote their own interests and industries within it. And we see here, this is um, some of the, the conferences in Luxembourg, uh, Portugal, and also the recently launched uh, Irish national government uh, strategy for, for enterprise uh, in outer space that was launched um, two years ago. Hence, it, what in the 1990s seemed like the fever dream of a few kind of uh, fringe wingnuts has become embedded in the nuts and bolts of mainstream space policy, policy in major spacefaring nations, or in the case of Europe, major uh, international spacefaring organizations, the European Space Agency. And noting this kind of shift um, from the first space age to the second uh, space age, uh, the growing role of the commercial sector isn't to assume that before or argue before that there was somehow the first space age was a, a noble period of pure scientific endeavor free of external motivations or values or interests. Of course, NASA's Apollo age was part of the Cold War a geopolitical competition with the Soviet Union. Uh, and there's always been uh, work of major public contracts being uh, involved with uh, private companies working with NASA, for example. The point is rather that the role of private companies in relation to the US space sector has followed broad patterns of neoliberal governance, where the state uh, on one hand kind of pulls back from areas of service provision to make way for market actors, and on the other hand kind of builds new, actively builds new architectures of governance to serve uh, new markets, produce new markets, and to uh, serve the industry inter interests of industrial actors. Uh, and the media, the mainstream media platforms, business publications, and specialist space sector publications have played a key role in kind of popularizing the idea of the kind of privatization of space, often in, in a very uncritical manner. And there have been innumerable articles over recent years kind of boosting the untold bounty to be found in our solar system and predicting a, a new gold rush for mineral resources to be mined within asteroids, the moon, and, and Mars. Of course, the, the public profile of those kind of celebrity tech billionaire tycoons, those little rocket men of uh, Silicon Valley have become kind of corporate leaders in the new space sector, such as Jeff Bezos of uh, Blue Origin, uh, Amazon and Elon Musk of, of SpaceX and, and Tesla, uh, have not only helped to kind of raise the profile of these ideas, but, but framed them not uh, as legitimate and even kind of excitingly kind of uh, future facing. Needless to say, the reality uh, is a bit more complex than a simple story of the privatization of space where private companies replace nation states as the key actors in outer space. Rather, na na nation states are playing a central role in the development of commercial interests in space through government contracts, through uh, research initiatives, and through new governance and legislative architectures that incentivize the emergence of new markets and businesses. And it's in this light that I want to examine the recent work of uh, the, Un the United States Geological Survey on Space Resources. And I think just before we kind of move on from kind of thinking about the, the broader arena of uh, new space and the commercialization of outer space, um, it's important to note the centrality within the new space sector of space mining and extraction. This is not the only activity that's counted as kind of new space. Uh, there's, you know, earth observation is a large section of it, um, logistics, communication, tourism, and many other spheres, but extraction is kind of central to the way in which the, the kind of sector of new space sector is imagined and particularly the way governments and the United States government in particular are relating to it. Um, extraction has played a particularly central role in the United States attempt to foster its own commercial space sector. And I would argue this is indicative of the United States kind of dual nature as a kind of global capitalist power, where on the one hand, the United States seeks to maintain geopolitical advantage over other major powers such as China, Russia, and the European Union um, by having privileged access to or control over key resources, even when those key resources, such as uh, minerals mined from space, remain speculative. On the other hand, the United States seeks to promote free trade and develop global markets, not only as a, as a means to seek competitive advantage for itself as a state and for US-based businesses, but in order to secure the global capitalist economy within which its power uh, is fundamentally structured. And indeed, historically, the extraction of mineral resources played a fundamental role in the formation of the United States as a state, with the processes of, of state formation following patterns of settler colonial expansion within which resource extraction and mining interests were central, although we've perhaps become uh, accustomed to kind of thinking of the, the colonization of the United States, uh, principally through the kind of framework of land appropriation with the idea of, of the kind of frontier opening up the West. But the role of, of resource extraction and mining uh, has been, uh, been absolutely key to, to this history. 
Hence, the United States' interest in playing a leading role in the expansion of mineral resource extraction into outer space is consistent with historical patterns of colonial state formation and imperial geopolitics that have characterized uh, it's the United States national history, at least for the last uh, two centuries. So before spoken, uh, focusing on the specifics of the US Geological Survey's work to support space mining, I, I just want to flag two other branches of government, two, two other initiatives that have been uh, developed in the United States over recent years, which also play into this idea of the kind of uh, development of space resource markets and the geopolitics around them. And these kind of set the, the kind of broader governance um, ecosystem within which the work of the United States Geological Survey on Space Resources takes place. So the first of these is the US Space Act in 2015. So under the Obama administration, US space policy pivoted towards an, an increasing central role for private industry in the work of NASA and other state bodies engaging in, a, in the space program, space policy. In 2011, Obama administration cut NASA's space shuttle program, making way for SpaceX to, to grow as a rocket business, um, basically providing um, are getting major contracts ferrying materials to and from the International Space uh, Station. They've been doing this since 2016. And uh, as of this year, uh, when there was the first test flight, they're going to start ferrying um, astronauts to and from the, the NASA astronauts to and from the, the International Space Station and eventually to, to other um, space stations, perhaps. Uh, in the meantime, since Obama uh, cut the, the NASA space shuttle, there's been, uh, until this year, the test flight of SpaceX. Uh, NASA astronauts got to the International Space Station basically hitching a ride on the Russian uh, space rockets, um, which was something that the, the US did not um, seek to advertise too much, but uh, interesting. Um, so we see, you see actually that uh, interesting to think about that, that in some sense, whilst I'm talking about the way in which um, we see a kind of new geopolitics of space or a renewed geopolitics of space opening up around commercial uh, mining and so on, we actually see that a lot of what's going on in outer space and the, the human presence in space is actually very collaborative. And it's one area where you find uh, very serious um, institutional cooperation between major competitive states, such as the United States and Russia, including in, in the realms uh, of uh, science. But in 2015, um, in, in kind of keeping with this trend towards the kind of neoliberalization neo of the US uh, space sector, um, Obama signed into law the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness, Competitiveness Act, or as it's more commonly referred to as the Space Act. And it was given the, the kind of subtitle of Spurring Private Aerospace Competitiveness and Entrepreneurship Act. You can see what they did there with the anagram which was the first piece of legislation, either domestic in any state or international, recognizing the right of private citizens and businesses to commercially exploit resources in outer space, and hence to kind of uh, laying the legal foundations for private property regimes of materials that, uh, that are extracted in outer space. Interestingly, the US Space Act of 2015 only applies to US citizens and businesses. So again, we can see that the, the, the recognizing of, of uh, or establishing legal foundations for a market also being seen to kind of take a um, national uh, competitive advantage within that by, by maintaining it only for US citizens and businesses. So industry figures and advocates of the free market frontier, so to speak, uh, such as the Space Frontier Foundation heralded this as a revolutionary moment for commercial space sector as it provided the legislative foundation for the development of off earth extractive industries. And indeed in keeping with their broader ideology, uh, a key moment in the future uh, uh, securing the future survival of the human species as a multi-planetary species in, in the, the light of looming uh, planetary uh, catastrophe on Earth. However, international lawyers, governments and academics have challenged the legality of the US Space Act, noting that it contravenes the major piece of international law governing activities in outer space, the United States Outer Space Treaty, which was signed in 1967, which prohibits any claims to sovereignty uh, or territorial claims being extended to the moon or any other astral body or any other celestial body, sorry, by occupation or crucially in its clause by any other means. Uh, and the dis dispute is going ongoing as to whether um, the recognition of private citizens and companies by the US and now other governments to, for, to exploit and extract uh, resources from those celestial bodies counts as uh, a claim to sovereignty or territory by one other means, so to speak. Um, which is a reading that, that, that I agree with myself. 
Um, and we can see the influence of, of this not only within the United State, States uh, space sector, but the fact that other countries have uh, followed suit, including uh, Luxembourg, which in 2017 launched its own kind of uh, legislation uh, recognizing um, the rights of individuals and businesses to extract resources and ma uh, make private property claims on those resources from outer space. Uh, they interestingly did not confine that to their own citizens. Uh, in keeping with Luxembourg's broader kind of um, uh, structure of kind of governance and finances, it basically any company that registers itself in Luxembourg uh, will be legally record its private property claims will be legally recognised by the Luxembourg state, and the United Arab Emirates is uh, also following with its own policy. I've actually not kept up with if that has been passed now, but they were over the last couple of years have been uh, designing their own kind of policy. I'm not sure if it's been launched yet or not. So the, the, the second aspect following on from the, the United States Space Act, the recognition of private property, was the more recent declaration under the Trump administration of US Space Force. And the pursuit of, of US dominance in outer space played a key role in Donald Trump's attempt to make America great again, and has been something of a pet project of, of his vice president, uh, Mike Pence. Um, central to Trump's plan alongside a return to, to Mars, or a return to the kind of plan to send uh, astronauts to, to Mars has, and to the dismay of many of the US military's top brass, was the introduction of this new branch of the US Armed Forces, the United States Space Force. And we can see here the, the launch uh, of the, the insignia, which is very Star Trek influenced uh, in January this year, when the, and the big um, grin on Trump's face there. I'm very happy with this. Um, and I think, you know, it's been interesting that the almost total collapse of governance or government politics and the mediation of those politics under the Trump uh, administration seemed to find as a apotheosis in the fact that this new branch of the US military was established simultaneously as a TV comedy series carrying the same name and parodying the, the launch of this force was released on Netflix, which, you know, I don't know if anyone's watched Space Force, the TV show, but it's, it's really not very funny. Um, and indeed, the military industrial media complex that <laughs> sees this situation arise isn't really a laughing matter either. Um, now, arguably, the US Space Force is contrary to both the letter and the spirit of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which, as a document that was born out of the Cold War space race, sought principally to outlaw the militarization of outer space. And interestingly, again, just as we saw with the influence of this, the, the Space Act in other nations, we see the influence of the US declaration of, of a space force with Emmanuel Macron in a diplomatic move, not unlike his kind of a power move to, to out handshake Donald Trump, rose to the occasion and announced that France too would uh, be launching its, its uh, own space force, or rather it would rename its air force, the Air and Space Force. Um, and I mentioned these developments alongside the NASA OSIRIS-REx mission uh, to indicate the concerted effort of various branches of the US state to establish the legal architecture for new markets of space resources in which US companies will have an advantage to fund and test technical instruments, mission programs and scientific research needed to make space mining feasible and move to institutionalize a more aggressive militarized presence in outer space with an eye to current and future geopolitical competitors. And it's in, within, in this context that we should view the recent move to kind of enroll or conscript the services of the United States Geological Survey in the development of space mining. So what I want to do for the rest of the time here is kind of turn towards uh, looking at the US Geological Survey, briefly outline its history in relation to colonial state formation and the extension of US imperial power, and what's actually happening in its relationship to its involvement in uh, space mining, and briefly conclude by kind of questioning what we as geographic scholars might understand and challenge the conscription of geological science into the extension of, uh, of the US kind of dominance in space, um, the, kind of, the kind of ethical stance that maybe uh, geological uh, scholars might take in regard to this. So the US uh, Geological Survey was founded by an act of Congress in 1879 as a new government agency under the Interior Department. And it was tasked with the responsibility of, quote, the classification of the public lands and the examination of the geological structure, mineral resources, and products of the national domain, end quote. And a gradual expansion of what constitutes the national domain can be traced across the lifetime of the organization up until the present. At the time of its foundation in 1879, the, the territorial integration of the United States North American lands was almost complete after a century of westward colonial expansion uh, through warfare, land purchases, and the settlement, of front, settlement activities of frontiersmen, and the rupture of the Civil War 
which ended in 1865, had nominally been uh, addressed. So we have this moment where the kind of US is kind of, uh, its North American lands are being kind of um, solidified. Um, but the process of state formation did not stop with securing formal sovereignty over the territory, but continued in the form of government surveys to map the lands of the West as storehouses of, of national resources for a growing population and uh, industrial development. Um, I'm going to skip ahead there a little bit. So Mary Collins Rabbit, the official historian of the United States Geological Survey, noted in the 1980s that its emergence was a natural step in the development of government uh, science in the US, making the new consolidated state interest in the provision of scientific knowledge to meet the needs of its growing economy and industrialization. However, given that the USGS is lit literal following in the, in the bootmarks of the US Army surveyors who preceded it, um, and was briefed with accounting for the mineral resources of newly colonized lands, we might say that this branch of government science participated in a form of settler colonial geology, or settler colonial geological science. If Frederick Jackson Turner's mythological account of US state formation saw the national territory and the character of the US forged in the colonial expansion of the nation into the frontier of the West, the, the United States Geological Survey helped carry out the subsequent work of colonizing a vertical frontier and mapping the mineral resources of the national domain, readying them for extraction by uh, state and private industry alike. And likewise, as we see the kind of role of USGS in the kind of colonial settlement of the United States, uh, and its colonial state formation, we also see it in, uh, being conscripted in the expansion of US imperial power from the end of the 19th century with almost every step in the expansion of US state power beyond North America being shadowed uh, by the work of the US uh, GS, which is brought along with it. Its extraterritorial forays began in earnest in Cuba and the Philippines after the Spanish-American War of 1898, but intensified as the US prepared to enter World War I with the search for minerals to feed the war effort extending to Central and South America and the West Indies, a pattern that continued uh, in readiness for World War II, uh, where its brief was focused pr primarily on so-called mineral uh, military geology. Sorry. At the end of the war, the USGS expanded globally in line with the post-war reach of US power and the emerging global fronts of the Cold War. And in keeping with the nomenclature of the emergent post-war liberal order and the hegemony of the United States within it and the era of decolonization, the work of the Geological Survey was increasingly carried out uh, from the late 1940s through programs of technical assistance with training programs already established in Latin America being extended to Afghanistan, India, Thailand, and the Philippines. Uh, and again, in the 1950s, this stepped up to include most countries, or many countries, I should say, across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The training in geological science took up its role in the Cold War containment strategy, whilst allowing the US state and companies to gain privileged access to newly prospected mineral resources across large swathes of the so-called economically undeveloped world. Hence, from the final years of the 19th century and for much of the next century, the USGS was an agency active in advancing the frontiers of geological knowledge, mineral resource extraction, and US geopolitical power simultaneously. I'm not to say it was the main driver of it, but it was kind of enrolled within that work. And what we see from uh, the kind of late 1950s with the development of NASA is that the way in which uh, the US Geological Survey is involved in the Cold War space race um, in 1959, making the first kind of photo mappings of the lunar surface. And this work was expanded in 1963 with the foundation of the Astrogeological Science Center in Flagstaff, Arizona, um, where this kind of work of lunar and planetary mapping was continued, but also where NASA started, to, or where they started to train NASA astronauts in geology and the methods and equipment to be used in lunar uh, exploration, a uh, relationship which has uh, persisted ever since. However, in the wake of the, of the Space Act, excuse me, I'm going to move forward, oops, uh, of 2015, the brief of the USGS had once again expanded this time to provide geological knowledge in aid of developing speculative markets in space resources. The Space Act was partly the result of effective lobbying by new space advocates and the political representatives of US states with active space sectors uh, to effectively lay that legal foundation we talked about, however contested, for a market in space resources that would generate investor confidence, allow the indus industrial sector to, to, to grow. And in 2017, uh, the USGS carried out a further confidence building exercise in the form of, of ASTRA, the Asteroid Resource Assessment, an initial study of the feasibility of asteroid mining. Although funding wasn't available, as we can imagine the reason why, for a full feasibility report, uh, the resulting feasibility study for the quantitative assessment of mineral resources and asteroids was undertaken to assess whether the process employed 
by the Geological Survey for making terrestrial mining resource studies might be applied to asteroids using water and iron as kind of test uh, cases for workflow. And they, they concluded that minimal adjustments would be needed to conduct a full resource assessment in the usual manner. The study concluded that while serious gaps in knowledge remain, quote, it is clear that the water and metal resources in near-Earth asteroids are sufficient to support humanity should it become a fully space-faring species. And indeed, that they noted the amount of useful resources in near-Earth asteroids is immense when compared to current needs. And that, there, that uh, a million-fold increase in human activity in space could be sustained for a million years. So <laughs> some pretty uh, seriously uh, uh, grandiose claims being made for their uh, initial study. It was, it was careful to frame the mandate of the geological survey as providing an uh, quote, unbiased, quantitative and reliable assessment of asteroid resources in aid of the long-term goal of the United States space program, which was a human presence on Mars. But it's clear that this knowledge is also being provided reliable data uh, or unbiased reliable data seem to be for investments in private space mining ventures that the state has moved to try and kind of uh, build a market around with the, the Space Act. And I'm just going to skip on uh, slightly a little bit just for the interest of time. Um, this kind of work has con uh, not only been with this feasibility report, this is the, the new or recently appointed 2018 director of the USGS, who is a former NASA astronaut, James F. Riley. Um, his appointment by the Trump administration in 2018 gives some indication of the direction of travel and the importance which uh, space mining um, has in the kind of a congressional view of the acti what the activities of uh, the geological survey should be. And the same year as uh, the US Geological Survey had James Riley appointed, they announced a collaboration with the Colorado School of Mines, uh, a uni university focused on mining, a college focused on mining, which launched the world's first graduate studies program in space resources um, to develop a new generation of geologists dedicated to the commercial exploitation of space resources. So how might we understand this? In our recent book, Rare Earth Frontiers, the geographer Julie Klinger maps the way in which various sites, including the moon, become figured as rare earth frontiers, spaces where processes of mineral resource extraction and geopolitical ordering take place simultaneously. Following Anna, uh, anthropologist Anna Singh's account of resource frontiers as spaces that are conjured as paradoxically empty and full, empty of order and civilization, but full of commercial uh, potential and resources, Klinger notes that the way the moon is increasingly being framed by state and private actors as just such a site over recent years. Although a geographic and environmental gulf seems to separate the moon, or asteroids for that matter, from conventional terrestrial mining sites, Klinger notes that there are strong similarities in how rare earth frontiers are figured and discursively constructed as frontiers and brought in then to patterns of state formation, territorialization, resource uh, appropriation, and, and environmental destruction. Framed within the context of resource frontiers, we can understand the recent expansion of the United States Geological Survey's brief to include the analysis of and prospecting of space resources as a sort of weaponization of geological science for the extension of US geopolitical interests in the work of building speculative markets um, for space mining uh, products. Just as the US GS has been conscripted from the moment of its foundation to provide geological knowledge in the service of first colonial state formation and later the expansion of the United States imperial power, it is now being enrolled as part of a merging geopolitical project to establish US hegemony over an extra global market in space resources. Um, it's been tasked with reliably conjuring, to use Singh's term, a new space resource frontier as full enough for the development of a viable space resource uh, market a million fold increase in human activity in space for a million years, as the, the report noted. Um, we might say, we though, So I was muted. I'm not sure what, where, where that happened. I just got a notification. Um, anyway, I will, I will conclude anyway, because I have the interest of time. There's nothing inevitable about the further militarization of outer space or the expansion of US geopolitical power over other worlds, or indeed the extractive plunder of so-called space resources. 
indeed, given the process of conjuring the space resources frontier and it's in, in its infancy, it's possible to stop this uh, before it gets further. There's many attempts to try and uh, provide kind of uh, forms of by government and non-governmental actors to kind of provide frameworks to regulate this, to have sustainable space mining. But they already kind of seem to assume that the cat is out of the bag and that the best can be done is to, to render this industry, which doesn't yet exist, sustainable in the future, rather than say, do we actually want to, to have this industry and kind of have wide ranging participatory debates concerning conditions under which that might be desirable uh, and not, and, and questions of alternatives to the supposed necessity of, of this as a resource fix. So perhaps this is the moment when geologists um, and geographers and other earth scientists might think about their role within this. So echoing recent calls for a critical physical geography from uh, Laura et al, um, that engages with the kind of value systems and social conditions within geographic knowledge is produced, we might think about the need for a critical astrogeology that might push back against the idea that the fascinating work of alien geology should be enrolled in the work of commercial resource extraction, capital accumulation, and imperial state formation. So during World War II, the Geological Survey earned the nickname of the Army's Pet Prophets, a name that is hardly a fair description of the scope of the work of the agency today, although perhaps today there's a need to ensure that this moniker does not in fact become more fitting in the sphere of outer space. And I will stop there in the hope that I haven't gone too far and you didn't miss too much when I was muted. That's great. Thank you very much, Rory. So uh, one question here, but thank you so much, Rory. Steph, should I start by reading the ones we have so far? And if anyone sure. else has questions, if A, if you would really like to say it yourself, you're most welcome. Um, just send me a little message to say that you'd like, you have a question. Uh, um, otherwise, you're very welcome to type it as well into the group chat or individually. Um, so the first question we have is from Jeff Smith, and it is, how do you see the European Copernicus and Galileo programs, which provides free and open access space-based information for public good and commercial exploitation, fitting into the new space paradigm? Should I answer them one at a time? Yep. Well, yeah, we can start with that. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Jeff, and, and thanks, Kate, for, for um, sharing the questions. Um, that's a good question, and I, I think, um, I would not say that the European Space Agency and European states are free of the kind of idea of a kind of a geopolitical um, role that space science and, and commercial activity in space um, can play. Um, they have a less kind of, they have, let's say they have a more cooperative ap approach to it and their vision of a kind of the global liberal global order is one that's more cooperative. Um, I think there's, there's a lot to be commended in the area of, of the open science. I mean, NASA is also uh, making a lot of, it's a, um, scientific research available to all. Um, I think this is very positive. The role of commercial space um, activities within that, I'm, I'm not necessarily against all commercial space activities. We already live in a world where, where we function, including this talk through the use of kind of uh, satellites and so on, often which are commercial. I don't think this is inherently um, the worst thing in the world. Um, I think the, the role of mining is what I particularly uh, oppose, uh, and the, the, seem the seeming necessity of this, um, which is usually legitimated on the basis that um, the planet is in crisis, environmental crisis, and we we're lacking resources, we're the scarcity problem, and we need to, to grab resources from outer space in order to kind of fix the earth, or in more, even more uh, ludicrous terms, to become a kind of a, a multi-planet species that will eventually leave earth. And, and this to me kind of carries a kind of moral hazard that it diverts attention away from actually addressing the, 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 the needs of, uh, that are already here in the sense of they're, they're, the scarcity of resources is, is a one which is uh, artificially produced uh, and, and, and uh, is shaped through structures of, of exploitation and, in, and global inequality. So I, I think the role of the European Space Agency with regard to mining, they're a bit more cautious of it, but the, the kind of Moon Village project, which uh, uh, Jan Werner's kind of pet project for the European Space Agency, he's the, the director, sorry, of the European Space Agency, has a kind of mining or testing, prospecting mining component to it. Uh, this I, I think is, a, is unfortunate. Um, and I, I don't think we could assume that the, the European Space Agency is, is entirely innocent of wanting to kind of claim a stake in um, a kind of resource grab or even in the production of a market around mining. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's, it's a, 
is much to be commended in the European Space Agency and, and at NASA as well. Um, but mining, I think, is a is a is unnecessary, damaging, um, and kind of also I think serves to kind of legit, seeing it as legitimate in outer space also seems to kind of feed back into kind of promoting and kind of making kind of future facing and sexy kind of extractive industries um, on Earth, in which you know we need to be very critical of how they operate um, as, as well. I might give you um, two or three questions now to follow, if that works for you. Um, sure. I can go back, so if, we'll just go from there. The first one is, has it ever been suggested that countries would make territorial claims in space? The second question, which is from Kean, is could you say a little bit more about the commercial practicalities of mining in outer space? How do they factor in the profitability in terms of labor and shipping of materials? Uh, it would seem that at least different kinds of capitalist exploitation um, need to come into play. And then as a final point, um, Iris has said, very interesting talk, agreed. Uh, following on from Jeff's question, is there a case for where the benefit of Earth observes OBS from our solution finding to Earth's environmental challenges is being used or hijacked to justify the exploitation of Thank you, Iris. Okay, um, so is there, um, is there a case where the benefit of Earth observation for, of our solution finding for Earth's environmental challenges is being, quote, used or, quote, hijacked to yeah. justify the exploration of space for mining ex or exploitation? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks, um, Kate, and thanks for the questions. Um, I'm not sure who, who it was who made the, the, the question about the territorial claims. Um, has this been suggested? Right. Mark. Mark, Mark, yeah. This has been suggested, yeah, um, many times. Um, although that said, the, the major piece of legislation, um, international treaty governing um, all activities in outer space, uh, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, it was explicitly framed uh, with, with the United States and the Soviet Union being the two major drivers of it. They weren't brought forcibly to the table. They drove it to try and, and uh, produce a, a legal architecture within which that would be rendered uh, outlaw and so sort of established the kind of outer space as the kind of um, the commons of, of humankind. Um, that's not exactly the phrase, sir, but it establishes an international commons. But there, there are kind of, uh, there is a whole field of called astrogeopolitics, which has at least two journals to its uh, name. Um, which is largely based in, in the United States, but we also have the kind of similar ideas in, in Russia and in, um, in uh, China as well. And, and there's you know, various other actors in, um, involved in the kind of broader space sector, including scientists, academics, uh, lobbyists, who engage in the idea of kind of bringing kind of classical ideas of, of geopolitics with kind of the territorial competition between states into the arena of outer space, uh, including territorial claims. But the governments of the world all um, disavow this as a, as an aim, uh, as a, an aim. Um, although I think we could be somewhat suspect of, of the development of, of, of this. Um, and I, th I think perhaps more interesting there in the sense is actually what, and it's one of the things that, that I'm trying to engage with, with this more broadly, is what, what is the nature of the concept of territory when it's in outer space? And if, if for example, uh, with the US Space Act of kind of, it does it amount to a sovereign claim for the US to back and recognize the private property claims of uh, citizens and, and, and private actors. So I mean, this is, this is a kind of the, the, the frontier of the US finding where the, the US says, these are our lands, you know, the state isn't present and the settlers, the private citizens go out and settle the, through making private property claims, they go out and settle the frontier. So there's kind of something of the similar logic there. And, but it, you know, the United States denies those are territorial claims, but I think we can say that they are territorial claims but those territorial claims take a different form perhaps than they uh, might usually be thought of in the kind of terrestrial environment, at least in, in the 20th century. So uh, Kian, um, that's a great question. So in one sense, um, I don't think it's commercially viable to space mine. I'm never sure how much uh, state actors or private actors in this field actually think it's gonna happen. Uh, I think some of them clearly don't, um, but they're just trying to kind of uh, develop revenue streams either for kind of um, to promote the ends of state otherwise or to produce kind of uh, capital flows. I think there's some uh, hardcore believers in this, 
they tend to frame it in very, very long-term missions of you know, planetary crisis, escaping the Earth to become a multi-planet species, within which the kind of usual time frames of capital investment and return don't really apply. And that's a problem for them in raising investment. That's why they want, um, in the, the new space advocates in the US particularly, wanted the United States to kind of come in with this legislative architecture and then kind of you know, involving the, the United States Geological Survey to make it uh, r r viable, to make, or to make it appear viable, to make it seem reliable, get data in there, get a legal architecture, so that there's an arena within which a market can, can be made. Basically, the state is, is in some sense making a market for these. Whether that market will, will be viable, I, I don't know. I'm kind of skeptical of that. There's all sorts of other aspects there. You mentioned kind of um, transport logistics, but also the exploitation of labor. Um, you know, I think most of, it, of the labor of extraction is envis envisaged, of course, to be um, robotic. Um, so, so there's not necessarily the, the, the direct point at the point of extraction of, of exploitation, but there, of course, there's questions about the exploitation of labor within uh, SpaceX um, productions and so on. And of course, how we think about the kind of fantasy frontier, or you know, maybe it becomes a real frontier of resource extraction in outer space, feeds back into the kind of actual real terrestrial frontiers. Uh, and some of the work that, that Julie Klinger and, and others have been doing is how, for example, um, the launch sites, um, which tend to be located in more equatorial regions because of the le it's easier to leave the gravity well of the earth. Um, these involve massive amounts of displacement of people, land appropriations, uh, producing huge amounts of toxicity for the environment. Um, and here the question of the relationship between uh, local communities, um, local environments, uh, sometimes indigenous peoples, um, how those the impacts on Earth of the space sector, including the commercial space sector, are racialized, class, gendered, and in, in all sorts of ways that we tend to think of um, in other other industrial uh, sectors, heavy industry, um, in terrestrial heavy industries. Um, not sure if that answers your question totally, but um, yes, and I think as in any kind of case, this is a kind of you know it's a a corporate capitalistic uh, project. It's going to have similar structures and effects to all those things and the disavowal of like, oh, there's no one involved, no one is displaced, no, there's no one exploited. It's just robotics ignores the fact that a lot of what happens, most of what happens in outer space actually happens on Earth. You know, so in the, the sphere of outer space happens on Earth, let's say, uh, hence the kind of bringing space back to Earth kind of idea. So Iris, I think a um, little bit as you said, kind of coming off the back of Jeff Smith's questions, I think there's lots of things about, for example, uh, Earth observation. I, I don't think that Earth observation necessarily has to be seen to be, oh, uh, being hijacked for resource uh, exploitation in out of, out of space. It certainly, of course, plays a role in resource exploitation on Earth. Um, there's a potential that that might happen. Um, but of course, we wouldn't want to throw out the idea that, oh, Earth observation and the work of, of space programs, but be it NASA, the European Space Agency, uh, JAXA, Chinese program or anything like that are inherently bad. That's not the idea. Or that, or that um, astrogeology is inherently bad either. It's, it's more the idea of, of how those uh, modes of scientific knowledge and those methods of, of data gathering and so on are um, conscripted and enrolled in kind of broader political um, and, and capitalist uh, projects. Uh, and I think it is possible to um, say, people say to say no. There's, there's, there's nothing uh, about that. But I think, you know, also with Earth observation, there's a move with the new space sector, not in the mining field, but in the Earth observation field, for kind of increased amount of, of private Earth observation actors who will sell their Earth observation data, um, whether it's for farming purposes, for um, ag agriculture, for transport systems, or for security purposes, such as tracking um, you know, unmarked objects in the Indian Ocean and so on. So there's a whole host of ways in which Earth observation in the private sphere is being mobilized for all sorts of other commercial um, and political ends, which are and security ends, which I think are, are very dubious. Um, and I'm not sure of the kind of regulatory architectures through which that is managed or that is governed, let's say, um, like who owns that data, who has a right to produce it and so on, when it's outside the sphere of, of states or interstate bodies and space programs producing that data. Um, um, I'm not sure how much time we have. We have eight to nine questions. So I'm going to ask, unless anyone has really important ones, maybe we can try to get through those quickly if, if that's all right with you, Rory. We've got like six minutes to do. I'm happy to stay longer, but um, I think maybe we should probably right. try and wind it up if, if uh, other people have to, to, to go. So uh, a next question is from Federico and it says, thanks for the talk, Rory. Um, what are your thoughts on the urbanization of space that is following the colonization of space and the mining of resources in space? 
I'll give you two more as well, and then we can do another round. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question from Piero. Thank you, Rory. Interesting talk. From a geopolitical point of view, as well as an economic one, would you suggest Europe stays away from mining and resource extraction while other nations engage in that activity? Steph has also just pointed out that these seminars are being live tweeted where possible, so you can follow that thread and the link attached in the group. Not a question, just an observation. Likewise, uh, Mary has made a comment just to say that not all mining will return to Earth. Some uh, will resource missions further out to other bodies. Michael has said, thanks Rory, great talk. Do you discount the fears about security of supply of critical minerals? Many of these minerals are concentrated in few hands. Encouraging this type of exploitation is a tool to reduce this advantage. I'll stop there for a moment if you want to take those three quickly. Uh, sure. Um, Federico, um, I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't really have any specific um, thoughts about the urbanization of space. I'm, I'm very keen to hear more about what you say uh, about this and maybe another juncture. Um, as part and parcel of the kind of pro the plans to projections to colonize outer space, I think. Um, whether from the, the European Space Agency's Moon Village to the US plans to, to private and state plans to colonize Mars, I think uh, we should be incredibly dubious of the ways in which these are imagined, as well as the ways in which they might practically be put in place. Um, I can see there being some, let's say, benefits uh, to all mankind, uh, sick, uh, of Moon kind of settlement for scientific research. Um, I think how that's done needs to be very carefully regulated and, and thought about. The European Space Agency in, in its plan for Moon Village does not plan to have the state as an overall um, overarching regulating body. It, it plans to have a business ecosystem within which the state and interstate actors will act as kind of a um, co-participants with, a, with um, private sector actors who they don't actually stand over. I think this is a recipe for uh, disaster, <laughs> certainly a recipe for commercial space mining attempts. Um, so I, I don't know particularly about the idea of a city uh, and how that maps onto the idea of a kind of space colony and so on. Um, I start to think about though a lot of these ideas, they're a bit in the form of science fiction, not to say they are science fiction, but a bit like how we understand science fiction. Really they're fabulations which kind of show kind of projections of how people think about the present. And they're very interesting to read those ideas of urbanizing uh, uh, other worlds as a way to kind of almost in a symptomatic sense of ideological symptoms of our own failure, failures of imagination to imagine our own world as being otherwise than it is. Um, Piero, uh, the idea of, so the kind of, should Europe um, stay away from space mining when other nations are doing it um, for because of geopolitical reasons or the Europe will be, you know, outcompeted or something then? Uh, I would say we shouldn't get to that point. And kind of the argument I would make would be, be that international law, existing international law, of which the United States, China, and so on are all signed up, outlaws this. Um, so the European Union and the European states, European Space Agency are all, are all different, um, can play a, a very important role in, in some sense, as they do perhaps with climate, to be in somewhat a kind of fair arbiter of liberal global order. Uh, and this is not something I think is fantastic for a start, but in the sense of these are our agreements, the, 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 the basics of um, our liberal world order, so to speak, and its projection into space. That's certainly better than what's imagined currently in the United States, um, in some sectors of the United States. And to say that, well, we should actually have a cooperative uh, basis for regulating any activities that happen in outer space, including uh, mining, rather than it get to the point of it's, it's already a kind of Hobbesian race for, for uh, resources and they're scarce and we're all gonna end up fighting over them. I think this is uh, an imaginary which is unnecessary. It's a projection onto a situation that doesn't exist, but it is a very dangerous consequences. And the role, I think, of Europe, if, if it should have one here, is to kind of push back against that and to emphasize cooperation and uh, uh, including in the sphere of sciences. Miri's point, I think, is an excellent one that uh, not all mining in space um, would be used for commercial exploitation or necessarily for the kind of geopolitical power uh, competition of, of states. I think the second point is a bit more mute given that to basically come to be involved in, in space mining and the uh, space sector of the, on the scale, you have to be a major power already in which you're already kind of part of a global uh, geopolitical uh, contest in some sense. Um, 
but that's true and i think that's that so i say it's it's not that that necessarily i don't think mining should happen um but maybe there's 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 conditions under which it might happen for example taking water out of parts of the moon to use to be further space exploration for the purposes of science uh, and i think uh, the conditions under which it happens that should be kind of uh, quite strongly regulated rather than just saying oh well now it's kind of out of the bag let's try and make uh, all types of, of of mineral mining for commercial purposes um uh to be to be uh, a free for all actually and back to maybe a little bit to Keen's point but the commercial profitability there's there's a kind of a paradox that most of the time the resources that are said to be mined they'll not be brought back to earth so they're figured as a kind of resource fixed to 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 earth's crises but actually they're often talked about as the kind of building blocks of further um space exploration or colonization depending who you're, you're framing it with and particularly important here is water rather than metals, uh, water being used to kind of break down to make oxygen and hydrogen to, 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 to get further into the um, space. And, and some of the discussions the minute about moon, the moon and kind of settling the moon is to set up a base for further exploitation because you're further outside the gravity well of, of uh, the earth. Therefore, it's much more uh, financially cheap but also less energy intensive to get further out into the, to the solar system without having to blast off, really pulling against the force of the gravitational force of the Earth. There's some, there's some great um, logic to these things as to the, how the mining will happen, which would fuel that. I think that needs to be highly regulated, but, but that, is, that is true. It's a good, good point. Last question, I actually forget. Uh, what it was. Um, well, uh, it was to do with uh, fears of security of supply of critical minerals. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'll just read, I'm going to just take two final ones that we can kind of add on right now, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so the reiterating that last one was about, um, do you discount the fears about security of supply of critical minerals? Many of these minerals are concentrated in a few hands, encouraging this type of exploration as a tool to reduce this advantage. The subsequent question mm -hmm. is from Jerry, uh, very interesting, Rory. Um, how does the long time scale that must be imagined for profitable exploitation fit with the short-term perspective of shareholder dividends? Mm -hmm. Are there ways of placing a line on future profits by asserting licenses today and selling those rights in the present rather than the mar a marketing of credit? And could those rights be so broadly defined as to cover a range of activities such as beyond mining as such? The last question I'm going to give, there's other comments in there for you to have a look at, Rory, but um, sure. I think we can do that after. Uh, the last question is a nice, concise one from Jeff. Uh, have you considered, quote, the Expanse TV show as part of your research? Smiley face. We'll end on that question. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, with Expanse, I have not watched it. I, I plan to kind of um, sit down and watch it as research <laughs> at some point, which puts me off watching it for enjoyment. But I've heard it's a, I, I did watch about half an episode and I, I find a, like a lot of kind of, uh, sci-fi tv shows the kind of characterization the plotting is, is so awful but some of the ideas are, are really pretty amazing um so uh, thanks for the, the reminder of that um the question about the the fears of security of uh, critical insecure supply of critical minerals um sure this is a this is a concern and, and i think you know thinking of how the role of um green technologies um, in addressing climate uh, crises and so on, makes these minerals perhaps um, often they don't form particularly very useful social functions in a minute, but they, they can, they're very important to addressing um, social and environmental needs uh, going forward. So I think that is a concern. You, you meant, the question mentions that they're located in very few hands. I think this is, this is the problem. Uh, it's not so much the scarcity of them, it's the, the, lo the location and, and governance of those minerals through structures that are incredibly unequal. I do not see space mining as a way to address that. I think space mining will, if anything, uh, will replicate or intensify the concentration of resources in a very few hands. And in fact, even developing space mining technologies and programs is incredibly resource intensive. And um, we could question whether it's a good use of resources given the scarcity. I don't think it's a solution to them. And again, the point of uh, actually the, the, the minerals and water seem to be in space being mostly figured as a way to get further into space rather than being brought back to earth, although there is that kind of contradiction there. So I think the kind of the scarcity of uh, mineral resources as with many other resources in our world and our societies is a, as a false scarcity, um, which is, is um, due to inequalities 
and not to, due to the kind of Malthusian things of there's too many people, it's the bad distribution and governance of those uh, resources. And I think that's the framework within which you need to think about uh, resources on, on earth. Um, and I think that should be the focus rather than trying to think about uh, uh, space elsewhere. Um, Jerry's question, there was kind of two. The first one about, about the, the investor um, aspect, as I mentioned to Kian, so the idea of, of, well, you know, investors normally want a five, maximum 10 year kind of exit strategy. Um, and there's a brilliant anthropologist based in Minnesota, and I can't remember his name, which is right, David Valentine? David Valentine, um, who has been working on this for, for really quite a long time from when the first kind of space mining companies um, uh, came about and, and looking at that kind of contradiction uh, between the kind of short need, the, the short term need for, for investor return and the long term kind of trajectory of this kind of as a viable industrial sector. And that, that tension isn't resolved. Um, so when he did his initial research in that, there wasn't a kind of state legislation such as the Space Act and so on. It was, the, it was around 2012 or 13 or so. And so actually that was a huge amount of lobbying that went into producing this, this Space Act and then the Luxembourg uh, Space Resource um, Governance Act to try and kind of produce those legislative fund, uh, um, frameworks within which investors could be more confident of a long-term investment rather than five, 10 years, we're talking maybe 30 years. And again, that's kind of what I would see the way in which the United States Congress is directing the US Geological Survey to provide kind of some geological confidence building uh, alongside this kind of legislative foundation to, to produce kind of um, increased investor uh, confidence. Uh, the question of rights, I didn't quite write it down. Um, that seemed a good one. Um, but beyond the questions, uh, what the point that, that, I, that I got at the end was uh, the question of, of all sorts of rights kind of beyond, like a bill of rights that would address things beyond um, uh, mining, mining rights. Uh, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's very necessary. There are some kind of uh, legislative uh, pieces of legislation outside the Outer Space Act, which uh, govern kind of things about uh, insurance, viability and rights of, for example, launching things into space, uh, you know, who's responsible for that and so on. I think there's, um, again, maybe the question of earth observation um, and maybe the question of, of kind of the European Space Agency's Artemis program of the making of scientific data produced by European states and the European Space Agency available to all open access. That, that's the choice of the European Space Agency, which is very commendable, but maybe some kind of system which makes those things kind of duties at a, at a broader um, global level and a kind of a, maybe a system of, of rights and respect to those duties and how, how things can be used. And this would be maybe perhaps one tool of kind of actually more effectively governing um, space, space mining um, activities. Um, but there's a whole host of, of rights. And, and as, you know, um, space becomes potentially more easy to access, cheaper to access with these SpaceX rockets and, and presumably they'll have competitors at some point, they're able to go up and down. There'll be all sorts of other types of activities that, that people want to do up there. Um, and I think at the minute there's, there's not a really uh, a, a very good or very fulsome kind of set of kind of legislative architectures for managing the kind of rights and duties of those. Um, and there's, of course, space libertarians who say, well, that's great. That's great about space. There isn't this governance system of rights and duties. You can do what the hell you want. Um, and, you know, there's some temptation to that, too. There's kind of a groups more active on the kind of cultural sphere, but also some amateur rocket launchers who are kind of uh, space anarchists who kind of want to uh, keep it a kind of domain of kind of freedom, but also kind of of kind of social equality rather than a kind of libertarian kind of like libertarian socialist. Um, most, most of what they do is kind of the work of, of reimagining space otherwise, rather than kind of actually proposing and having the capital to get there to do anything. Um, but those, those, are, those are very interesting in terms of kind of thinking about how we imagine uh, other worlds um, in outer space. Um, 